Can people with autism across the spectrum read literary fiction? Can they enjoy and profit from the experience? Well, for years, experts have said no. Welcome to the Convocations Program at Carleton College. I'm your host, Kerry Rott, Director of Events. And uh, we are delighted to have you join us here. We'll be together for one hour and we'll include time for some questions. Uh, you may click the Q&A tab on your screen at any time to submit your questions. And then I'll pose those to our guest speaker at the conclusion of his presentation. Ralph James Severis is a disability scho studies scholar, a poet, essayist, and professor of American literature at Grinnell College. He's the author of Reasonable People, a memoir of autism and adoption, which Newsweek called a real love life love story and an urgent manifesto for the rights of people with neurological disabilities. In 2018, he published See It Feelingly, classic novels, autistic readers, and the schooling of a no good English professor which the Thinking Person's Guide to Autism praised as a collaboration of rare beauty. For decades, we've been told that people with autism have impairments in language, imagination, and social understanding. According to this view, literature would be the last art form that such people might respond to deeply. Professor Severis offers a very different view in his presentation titled, The Difference That Neurodiversity Makes or reading novels with autistic people. Welcome, Professor Sepris. Greetings. It's a pleasure to be at Carleton virtually. I'd hope to be here in, uh, in person. Thanks to Chris Martin for the invitation to speak and to Carrie Rott for all of the arrangements. I come to you from downtown Iowa City, where I live. As you just heard, in late 2018, I published this book, See It Feelingly, Classic Novels, Autistic Readers, and the Schooling of a No Good English Professor. The cover image, courtesy of the Whaling Museum and Education Center at Cold Spring Harbor in Long Island, New York, shows two African-American masthead watchmen aboard the whale ship Daisy in 1912. They are looking for whales. One of the classic novels that I discuss in my book is Herman Melville's Moby, Moby Dick. My title, See It Feelingly, comes from Shakespeare's play, King Lear. In act four, scene six, the Earl of Gloucester, whose eyes have been gouged out, begs to be led to the cliffs of Dover so that he may jump off and kill himself. While on the heath, he runs into Lear, who foolishly bequeathed his kingdom to his conniving daughters and has himself plunged into madness. As Lear decries the failure of ordinary sight to uncover ruthless deception, Gloucester invokes a different and in the end superior kind of vision. Your eyes are in a heavy case, your purse in a light, and yet you see how this world goes, the king says, I see it feelingly, Gloucester replies. I use this line to suggest the nature of literature's hold on us. When we read a novel, as scientists and cognitive literary scholars have demonstrated, we see it feelingly. We produce, that is, sensuous mental imagery in our heads, visual imagery, auditory imagery, tactile imagery, motor imagery, even olfactory and gustatory imagery. And this imagery is bathed in emotion. As the great Italian neuroscientist Vittorio Galese has written, visual imagery is somehow equivalent to an actual visual experience. And motor imagery is also somehow equivalent to an actual motor experience. You might think of, even think of literature as a verbal cinema of emotion a kind of old fashioned movie house in which neither a projector nor a screen is necessary. It's all internal. But autism and literature 
For decades, the prevailing view was that autism's so-called triad of impairments in communication, imagination, and social interaction made literature, especially fiction, too difficult to understand, too difficult to understand and too alien to relate to or invest in. Literature, after all, depended on things like figurative language and complex theory of mind, things that autistics were said to be bad at. With the rise of the neurodiversity movement, however, a new emphasis on difference, not deficits, old truths have fallen away and a new portrait of autism has emerged. That new portrait leans heavily on the sensory aspects of autism, the way that autistics, as Donna Williams once put it, live in the sensory. They are bottom up processors, discovering the world as it unfolds, whereas neurotypicals are top down processors leading with ideas. Autistics rely more on sensory cortices in the back of the brain, and they sometimes have trouble subordinating low level perceptual input to abstract concepts, in part because they see so much detail and generalizations seem an affront to what they perceive, irreducible particularity. In the introduction to See It Feelingly, I note that Temple Grandin's famous phrase, thinking in pictures, it's the title of one of her books, lines up nicely with what literature asks us to do. Let me take a second to say a bit about my autistic collaborators. Here they are on the screen and to tell you what I read with each of them. They couldn't be more different from one another. And that is my first important point. Autistic people are as diverse as non-autistic people. I adopted my son DJ from foster care when he was six years old. He was in diapers, didn't speak, and had been labeled profoundly retarded. In May of 2017, he graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Oberlin College as the institution's first non-speaking student with autism. He uses a text-to-voice synthesizer to communicate. In 2018, Deej, the documentary that he starred in, wrote, and co-produced, won a prestigious Peabody Award and was selected Best of Festival at the International Disability Film Festival. He was also nominated for an Emmy after appearing on PBS. With DJ, I discussed Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. At the time, DJ was a junior in high school, and it was the key text in his American literature course. Because he had been nearly killed by his birth mother and then repeatedly assaulted in foster care, I was quite worried about how he might react to the novel. After all, it famously presents an adopted and abused child protagonist. Quote, Pap got too handy with his hickory and I couldn't stand it. I was all over welts, Huck tells us at the beginning. Unlike the stereotype of autism, DJ is quite responsive to the emotions of others. In a reply to his ninth grade English teacher's question, what are your strengths as a reader? He said, I feel characters' feelings. He then added, dread very scary books and wish I took breathing easy mom to class to create more security. Tito Raharshi Mukupajai is also non-speaking, but unlike my son, he's never been allowed in a regular classroom. Emigrating from India at age 12, he was educated at night by his mother. While she worked, he languished in a special ed classroom. The tagline for my son's film is inclusion shouldn't be a lottery. Tito, like so many other autistic people, had a losing ticket. For the past decade and a half, I've been meeting weekly with him by Skype to talk about fiction, poetry, and memoir. When we meet, I speak, and Tito uses the sidebar to type his comments. Undoubtedly, the world's most famous non-speaking autist, someone who is compelled scientist to rethink claims of mental retardation in classical autism, Tito has authored six books 
including how can I talk if my lips don't move? With Tito, I discussed Herman Melville's Moby Dick, two chapters a week for 17 months. Listen to how Tito described our process. Quote, we each have Skype accounts and use them to discuss the novel face to face. Once a week, we spread the worded whale out in front of us. We dissect its head, eyes, and bones, careful not to hurt or kill it. The professor and I are not whale hunters. We are not letting the whale die. We are shaping it, letting it swim through the web with a new and polished look. I see the professor's face floating on the computer screen. I see my face in a smaller box below, wondering about its projected image. Perhaps my face, like Moby Dick, floats on his computer screen." End quote. Jamie Burke learned to speak at age 13, though he still prefers to type his deepest thoughts and then to read them aloud, especially when he is nervous. He and I were guests on a memorable Iowa public radio show devoted to the burgeoning neurodiversity movement. The audience who had been prepped beforehand heard the sound of fingers on a keyboard followed by Jamie's proud voice. Because he had minored in Native American studies at Syracuse University, you can see some of his native inspired art on the screen. I chose Leslie Marmon Silko's seminal novel, Ceremony, which concerns a mixed race Laguna Pueblo war veteran whose healing from PTSD comes about after he embraces long neglected rituals. I was repeatedly astonished by Jamie's insights. For example, traumatic recovery involves, he said, not vitally destroying the emotion of fear, but moving through the connection it brings to life, end quote. At one point in our discussions, painfully aware of the educational opportunities that most autistic people have been denied, he asked, how do kids search in their hearts when they cannot read these books? Dora Raymaker returned to school in her 40s and received her PhD in system science. While earning her doctorate, she co-founded Aspire, the Academic Autistic Spectrum Partnership in Research and Education, an organization devoted to the principle of community-based participatory research. Put simply, it strives to include people with autism as fellow researchers, not just as research subjects in high-level studies. Dora is currently the associate editor of a new journal, Autism in Adulthood. With her, I read Philip K. Dick's sci-fi classic, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? The novel hinges on the question of whether the replicants who are said to lack empathy are really less human than the empathy-challenged humans who hunt them. For years, of course, scientists claimed that autistics lack empathy. Dora passionately identified with Rachel Rosen, Dick's android heroine. In one scene, Rachel seduces the bounty hunter Rick Deckard in an attempt to save her fellow androids. I'm not alive. You're not going to bed with a woman. Don't be disappointed, okay? Have you ever made love to an android before? She asks. When he says no, she responds, I understand it's convincing. Uh, if you don't think about it too much. But if you think too much, if you reflect on what you're doing, then you can't go on for uh, physiological reasons. Oh, I love how Rachel has played Deckard, how she has turned the knife of the sex object the other way and landed it in his gut instead of her own, Dora said. Her comments about the novel both enriched and complicated research showing greater interest in objects than people in autism. In fact, they pointed to a different kind of empathy altogether, empathy for the more than human. In 2018, Dora published her own sci-fi novel, Hoshi and the Red City Circuit, 
which features a sleuthing neurodivergent heroine. Eugenie Belkin is a multiracial autistic woman and the mother of an autistic child. She is also deaf. She uses a cochlear implant in one ear and a hearing aid in another. She is completely fluent in ASL and has worked in schools for the deaf. A classically trained ballerina, Eugenie now works as a choreographer for competitive ice skaters. With her, I discussed Carson McCullers' The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, which features a deaf protagonist named John Singer, who the other characters, a labor activist, a black doctor, a closeted trans cafe owner, and a tomboy musician believe divines their thoughts. Initially, Eugenie was pleased to encounter a deaf hero, but she quickly became disheartened by the mythic representation of disability. Early in our discussion, she commented, it would be offensive if something fantastic isn't done with Singer's character. The book began with two deaf men, I'm curious to see where things go. Not two weeks later, she said, I am in hopes that Singer is not a prop. And still later, I pray that things develop with Singer. I'm beginning to tire of him being a silent sounding board for others, end quote. Eugenie also grew frustrated with the failure of each character to appreciate the differences of the others. As a reader, Eugenie brought to our discussions a complex identity. In addition to being deaf and autistic, she's Black, Asian, Native American, and Jewish. Again and again in her life, she had had experiences in which people from one group didn't want her to be something from another, let alone 10 different things. The novel, you might say, aggravated a long history of breaking the identity mold. Temple Grandin needs no introduction. She is famous the world over for her innovations in livestock handling. The author of many books and the subject of a Golden Globe award-winning film, she first reached a wider audience through the late neurologist Oliver Sacks' profile of her, an anthropologist on Mars. In that profile, Sacks suggested that Grandin was uninterested in literature, not only uninterested, but also incapable of appreciating its social, emotional, and linguistic nuances. The good doctor, it turns out, was wrong. For example, Temple told me that her freshman year literature course was her favorite one in college. And from memory, she recited lines by Wordsworth and Dante. And after we finished our work together, she kept leaving uh, me messages on my phone, telling me about all sorts of other literary works she had remembered reading. With Temple, I discussed two short stories from a recent anthology, Among Animals, The Lives of Animals and Humans in Contemporary Short Fiction. In one story titled Meat by C.S. Malarek, a man is appalled by the horrors of commercial livestock production and decides to humanely raise and kill the animals that his family eats. In another story titled The Ecstatic Cry by Midge Raymond, she is pictured on the screen, a female biologist devotes herself to saving endangered Gentoo penguins in Antarctica. In both stories, of course, complications arise. The family becomes attached to meat the name they give to their first pig in order to remind themselves of its fate. The biologist who has grown to abhor her own species longs in her Antarctic solitude for companionship and sex. The second story elicited a significant emotional response from Temple. Whereas I had thought that she might identify with the biologist who at least partially regrets her aversion to human intimacy, Temple dug in. I've seen so many bad marriages, she said. I haven't seen a single marriage that I could imagine being in. Recalling a traumatic event from her youth, one that she'd never before made public, Temple re-narrated her decision to be celibate, giving it a much less neurological 
and a much more feminist cast. For decades, she had said that autism made sex and romance impossible. Literature, to put it simple, simply, had worked its reflective magic. You've now met my autistic collaborators in the time that remains. I wanna give you a taste of my 17 month journey reading Moby Dick with Tito Mukupajai. The plot of the novel, if you haven't read it, is quite simple. A ship captain named Ahab lost his leg to a monstrous white whale named Moby Dick. Pretending to set out on a typical whaling voyage, at this time, the oil extracted from sperm whales lit the lamps of New England. Ahab seeks revenge, not monetary gain. At the end of the novel, just before Moby Dick destroys the ship, killing everyone but the narrator Ishmael, Ahab cries, to the last I grapple with thee, from hell's heart I stab at thee, for hate's sake I spit my last breath at thee. I've already read aloud, it's there on the screen, Tito's description of our journey, but I wanna say a few more things about it. First, notice how Tito understands perfectly well the purpose of discussing literature, an activity that he wittily describes in contradistinction to the slaughter and dismemberment of the whale. Anyone who has read Moby Dick will recall the passages depicting this gruesome process. Notice too, Tito's sense of metaphor. The web is a watery world through which the reassembled whale swims. Notice finally, Tito's identification with Moby Dick. Like the Leviathans, his natural habitat is the ocean. Our tutorial was less a hunt, he implies, than a cooperative encounter between man and whale, neurotypical and autist. Again and again, I was struck by how much Tito identified with this creature whose liquid life seemed analogous to his sensory one. In a composition inspired by Moby Dick, Tito lamented his own shipwrecked body, painting the land with its reliable solidity as the terrain of neurotypicals and the sea with its constant tumult as the terrain of autistics. The Moby Dick of disorders swims within you. No seesaw can be as intense as the seesaw of hyper and hyposensitivity, rocking you from one end to the other, lifting you up, dropping you down, then lifting you up again throughout the ocean of days, months, and years that we call life. Awake, you feel the fish under your feet. Asleep, you feel the slimy eel under your back. No matter how much you pace yourself or rock your body to compensate, the seesaw finds your nerves and rocks you ever more furiously into an exhausted self. You grow old as a wave, fluid and always displaced. As anyone paying attention to the autobiographical literature knows, autistics have been reporting inadequate or excessive sensory input for years. And many have pointed to this fact and the anxiety it causes as the reason for their purportedly bizarre behavior, such as stimming, rocking, or flapping their hands. As Temple Grandin notes, auditory and tactile input often overwhelm me. Loud noises hurt my ears. When noise and sensory stimulation became too intense, I was able to shut off my hearing and retreat into my own world. At times, while reading Moby Dick, Tito presented his sensory disturbances as a legitimate reason for not including him in regular education. Let me tell you the reason why I'm not the right person to be educated in a classroom, he explains. I am an isolated whale for reasons beyond my control. I have autism and learning with typical mammals will not work for me. I need more territory for my tactile defensiveness. Even the rising temperatures of the bodies around me in a classroom might cook me up. There is also the problem of my auditory sensitivity. 
If I were to hear a breathing sound from someone on my left, or perhaps a secret gulp from someone on my right, I might not have any control over those sounds boring into my cerebrum. They might expand inside me, their decibel level increasing, beginning a butterfly effect, dragging me from the coast like a riptide, then dumping me on a distant island resembling the smooth back of a white whale. Between me and the continent called a classroom far away would be the sea and its rolling waves. Above would be questions like gulls hovering in the sky. Inclusion, Tito suggests, would be too disruptive. It could provoke a meltdown at once embarrassing to him and incomprehensible to his teachers and fellow students. And yet, at other times, he presented virtual learning as a regrettable solution to ignorant and unwavering prejudice. I long ago gave up on the terrestrial world of an inclusive classroom because I was unwelcome and because I was too proud to beg. To the principals of the various schools who closed their doors to me, I was a sea mammoth. They could not recognize anything but typical. Their zoos were spilling over with typical students. And so I began to sharpen my harpoons behind the computer screen, Tito explained. There are harpooners who chase college degrees. Harpooners like me chase whales hoping to catch the perfect whale in the shape of literature. Here you can see Tito making the best of a bad situation, being deprived of a formal education. With a mixture of pride and regret, Ishmael declares in the novel, a whale ship was my Yale College and my Harvard. When we later read Andrew Del Banco's biography of the writer, Tito saw just how indomitable a will Melville had. The man overcame his own lack of a post-secondary education, mountains of debt, a literary marketplace that couldn't make sense of his finest work. One reviewer referred to Moby Dick as so much trash, the death of two sons, and a persistent despondency. After we returned from a trip to Arrowhead in Western Massachusetts, where Melville wrote Moby Dick, we also went to Mystic Seaport with the Charles W. Morgan, the world's only remaining, remaining wooden whaling vessel is docked. I asked Tito what he had learned. I can feel the rejection, the determination, and all we heard about Melville. And I realized that I'm not the only person in the world that I must pity. By now, it should be clear the extent to which Tito identified with Melville's whale, analogically borrowing its habitat to evoke the alternative sensing of autism. Yet like the whale, Tito also felt hunted. When he encountered Ahab, he compared the captain's obsession with killing Moby Dick to our culture's obsession with, vanquished, with vanquishing autism. Just as Ahab believes that the white whale maliciously took his leg, so many people believe that autism maliciously takes their children. Of his infernal antagonist, Ahab proclaims, I see in him outrageous strength with an inscrutable malice sinewing it. The inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate. Like Moby Dick, the whale, the severely autistic present an exasperating enigma. Try as you might, you cannot crack the mystery of their strange behavior. You cannot penetrate their wordless gaze, or so the stereotype contends. In the novel, Ahab rails against the creature's silence. Approaching the severed head of a leviathan, he smugly issues a command. Speak, thou vast and venerable head. Speak and tell us the secret thing that is in thee. The whale, of course, cannot speak. Moreover, it is dead. 
Ahab is driven as much by the impossibility of communicating with his enemy as by the loss of his leg. Precisely because speech is considered the quintessential mark of the human, Tito is despaired of his own inability to speak and of what that inability has allowed people to presume about his intelligence. Did you ever wonder how so much sound can hide in the inch and a half of a typical person's mouth? Tito asks. I guess you notice things like this when your own mouth contains but a few limited sounds. In a poem titled Harpoons, Tito maps the slaughter of whales onto a typical scene with a severely autistic child, ghoulishly intimating that violent death might be a form of speech therapy. Harpoons. With harpoons, they queried. They lacked finesse. He voiced no response except some noisy breaths, excavating sound from deep in his chest. What pointed questions. They injured his head. He breathed to explain how he talks with that head, great blubbery words that rise from his chest. Is there a mind, they wondered, inside that head? The sound of his answers, those cumbersome breaths, let blood uproot what's locked in his chest. Now, it may seem hyperbolic to suggest that the common hysteria surrounding autism is equivalent to mercilessly hunting and killing whales. But look at it from the autist perspective. What message does he or she or they receive from our culture? How frequently do we refer to autism as a devastating disorder? How rarely do we speak of it in positive or even neutral terms? How much time and money do we devote to improving autistic lives as opposed to curing it? What opportunities do we offer autistics for fulfillment? Even scientists, however dispassionate their words and work, often play into a narrative of relentless pathology. You have calculated the intelligence of an autistic person, Tito writes. You have measured his skull and found it bigger than others. You have measured the white matter over gray matter. You have measured his emotions, but could you help me to calculate the number of steps to the moon? Tito would rather live on that desolate rotating orb than perpetually confront the medical and education establishments to say nothing of the autism alarmists. In a satire of the rising incident rate of autism, Tito quips, Beware, beware, one out of 88, or 88 out of something, or something out of 88, or perhaps I'm getting confused because 88 looks like two giant infinities, heads down, bodies up. They have no legs to run. It is for this reason that Tito appreciated Ishmael's defense of the whale in Moby Dick. The Pequod, the name of the ship, was no place for a cetacean advocate, but that's where Ishmael found himself about the mammal's inability to speak, Ishmael says, quote, seldom have I known any profound being that had anything to say to this world, unless forced to stammer out something by way of getting a living. And about the whale's alternative vision, Ishmael remarks, the position of the whale's eyes corresponds to that of a man's ears. And you may fancy for yourself how it would fare with you did you sideways survey objects through your ears. While such vision most certainly has its drawbacks, among other things, a considerable gap at the center of the visual field, it also has its advantages. By working in a monocular, monocular fashion, each eye retains its autonomy. As a result, the whale's brain, according to Ishmael, can at the same moment of time, attentively examine two distinct prospects on one side of him and on the other in an exactly opposite direction. 
Imagine a man, Ishmael boasts, simultaneously going through the demonstrations of two distinct problems in Euclid. Ishmael also celebrates the virtues of the whale's ear and pointing out how wondrously minute it is, he comments, is it not curious that so vast a being as the whale should see the world through so small an eye and hear the thunder th through an ear which is smaller than a hare's? But if his eyes were as broad as the lens of Herschel's great telescope and his ears capacious as the porches of cathedrals, would that make him any longer of sight or sharper of hearing? Not at all. Why then do you try to enlarge your mind, subtilize it? In this way, it took no effort at all for Tito to link Ishmael's defense of the whale's alternative sensing to neurodiversity's defense of autism. Sharper of hearing, let me say a few words about that. I've already mentioned how much detail autistics attend to. In his most recent book, Plankton Dreams, What I Learned in Special Ed, it's a fantastic satire, Tito remarks, hyper-focusing makes the world seem shattered. I would say that the world is shattered. Underlooking makes it seem whole. When you see as much detail as many autistics do, the integrity of the world, that contrived frontal lobe agreement, collapses. Autistics are deridians of sight. But this pension for detail shows up in autistic hearing as well. A study from 2008 found that autistics exhibit superior perceptual processing of speech relative to controls, meaning that they actually hear speech sounds more precisely and robustly than neurotypicals, but inferior semantic processing, meaning that they do not treat those sounds as well phonemically. With respect to neurotypicals, the author speculated that, quote, increased attention to content information resulted in poorer perceptual than comprehension performance. As the cognitive scholar Reuven Sir notes, in the ordinary mode of speech perception, quote, only an abstract phonetic category, such as A, B, or I is perceived. What he calls pre-categorical auditory information is lost, in large part because phonemic conversion requires a reductive distortion of the sound wave. We hear a unitary phoneme that is very different from the stream of auditory information that conveys it. Sir says, we learn to generalize, to produce a thoroughly homogenized phonetic category, one capable of working across all manner of voices and words. But who cares about superior perceptual processing of speech, you might ask? Well, a literature professor, for one. In poetry, some of the rich pre-categorical auditory information may reach consciousness, Sir contends, strongly affecting the emotional or poetic qualities of the speech sounds. For Sir, poetry's various patterning techniques, such as rhyme, alliteration, consonance, and assonance, preserve a portion of the pre-categorical auditory stream, what autistics hear naturally, even as these techniques work to reshape it. But he concedes that poetry often fails to do this for many listeners because they are too plugged in to semantics. Anyone who has ever taught poetry knows that the art form either tends to stump people or they reduce it to a convenient message. What Walter Benjamin once termed the penny in the slot called meaning. At the same time, a poem that did not behave more or less responsibly with respect to the denotative and connotative properties of words would not be a poem. Of course, the ideal listener or writer of poetry attends to both sound and semantics. Indeed, they interpret in a musical way. Autistics and neurotypicals thus each bring to poetry 
and I would say to literature generally, a fluid and malleable set of cognitive strengths and weaknesses. Consider how Tito takes up this habit of attending to lower percep level perceptual input where it is most welcome. In a poem titled, I Kept But Sorry Guard, he deploys Ishmael's failure to look for whales on the masthead of the Pequod as a metaphor for his own failure to listen for meaning on the masthead, as it were, of human speech. Here is the passage from Moby Dick to which Tito alludes. This is Ishmael speaking. Let me make a clean breast of it here and frankly admit that I kept but sorry guard. With the problem of the universe revolving around in me, how could I, being left completely to myself, how could I but lightly hold my obligations to observe all whale ship standing orders? Keep your weather eye open and sing out every time. I say your whales must be seen before they can be killed. On the masthead, the young philosopher, as our narrator Ishmael humorously refers to himself, is, quote, lulled into such an opium-like listlessness of vacant, unconscious reverie by the blending cadence of waves with thoughts that he loses his identity, end quote. Indeed, he forgets his job as watchman, forgets even the frontal lobe concept of whale or water, or, or masthead. When this occurs, Ishmael says, quote, there is no life in him except that rocking life imparted by a gently rolling ship by her, borrow, by her borrowed from the sea. Up there with the seagulls and the wind clinging to that spar we call a human voice, Tito fails to listen to the meaning of what a conversation partner says. But something mysterious and ennobling, he implies, is at least the equal of semantic comprehension. Here is the poem. I kept but sorry guard. His voice was a mere frequency of sound. Like any other voice, it carried a wave in sound. I saw the wave come bouncing around. There might have been words moving along that wave, moving past me, sailing down that wave, lingering a little before they escaped. The voice before me, its frequency was blue, light as the light, the spreading of that blue, lulled into listlessness. I was lulled into blue. He asked me questions, maybe one or two, as I manned the masthead, but failed to pursue those shoals of meaning in a faraway blue. Whereas autistics keep sorry guard over meaning, neurotypicals, Tito implies, keep sorry guard over pre-categorical sensation. As I've said in literary writing, especially poetry, we're hunting two kinds of whales, or rather one hybrid one. That Tito can use words, however belatedly, to communicate his orientation to speech sounds testifies to his tremendous gifts as a writer and to the great distance he has traveled as someone with classical autism. There is so much more to say, but I'll stop here and take your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Severis. And now let's turn to some audience questions. First question, how is it different to lead a discussion of literature with students with autism than those without? Um, the first, great question, thank you for it. Uh, first thing I would say is um, in a typical classroom, we value comportment to what is to me an outrageous degree. So you must be prepared for all sorts of things to happen. And one of the things I've advocated uh, for the last 25 years is being more imaginative about accommodation. If someone needs to get up and walk around the classroom, if somebody needs to rock or stim or make uh, soft noises, um, let's let them do it. 
let's let's create a level of comfort which will then reduce anxiety and sort of bring down some of the more what otherwise people would call disruptive habits those things will be decreased significantly this young man says what advice do you have for autistic people who do struggle with literature and understanding it more deeply such as me another great question thank you for it the first thing i want to say is um i don't think it's your fault i started my career as a teacher as a high school english teacher and i saw how badly literature gets taught how unfun it is uh, or it was and so the first thing i'd say is take um uh don't demonize yourself don't see yourself as somehow a faulty reader when i run workshops or do these tutorials one-on-one -on -one, i don't make it about a right answer or theoretical sophistication we try to have fun and what i've discovered is that in that process um people relax and discover they have talents they were told they don't have Many abled people have been taught to think of the lived reality of many disabled people as failure. Where do you think the roots of this line of thinking lie? So it's a great question, and many scholars in the field of disability studies have addressed it. Um, the notion of the normal and the abnormal is, is, a, is a development in human history, and it's a development largely tied to the Enlightenment and then to capitalist modes of production. And so before this period, these periods, um, people weren't, we didn't rigidly monitor these differences, pathologize them, and then label them. But, you know, the other thing to think about is that we've done this to all sorts of groups and we continue to do it. We pathologize, we use a norm to imagine lamentable departures from that norm. Um, and so, uh, you know, the work of uh, disability rights and disability studies is to challenge as vigorously as possible the notion of a norm and the notion that difference is pathological. We all struggle with things, both with our bodies and, and with cognition. It's just that the world has been set up to maximize able strengths and to minimize those weaknesses. So we need to change the world, but also change how we think about difference and all kinds of differences. Could you discuss neural cosmopolitan mixing and what that would yeah, look so, like? Yeah, so I coined this term. So did Nick Walker independently, a, a, a wonderful autistic writer. Um, years ago, almost 15 years ago. And what I was trying to get at was this sense of the journeying I mentioned that Tito has undertaken as somebody, a non-speaking person with autism, with the burden of explanation, of sympathetic, hospitable explanation of his differences has fallen on him. So he's had to learn our language, our cognitive habits, um, our cognitive proclivities in order to make himself legible. And so what I was imagining um, reading the, uh, you know, lots of writing about cosmopolitanism, co cosmopolitanism more generally was some kind of two-way movement that we might be respectfully at home in other countries. We might be respectfully at home with all manner of neurologies, and that it's the burden doesn't just fall on autistic people to explain their differences. So that's a start. You can go to academia.edu and freely download um, lots of writing about neurocosmopolitanism that I've done. You've discussed reading and neurodiversity at length. What about writers? Do you see political and or critical value in thinking of canonical writers like Emily Dickinson or James Joyce as neurodivergent? I, I, I absolutely do. Um, I'm not a huge fan of diagnosing people in the past. I would rather think uh, in this way, 
that they were neuro, there have always been neurodivergent people and there have always been neurodivergent writers and that um, why diagnose them narrowly or rigidly? Um, I understand what is positive about that. In other words, finding precursors, heroes and the like. Um, I do think thinking about Emily Dickinson's visual, very significant visual impairment about her relatively limited social life. There's a lot there to mine um, uh, for disabled people and writers. Um, but there's so many wonderful writers um, uh, operating today. You have somebody who's teaching a course, I think this semester at Carleton, Chris Martin, who works with autistic writers, helping them to produce their own poems, doing amazing stuff, has started a press called Unrestricted Press to publish the writings of these writers. You had said that all autistic individuals are as diverse as neurotypical individuals, which I agree with completely. Could you touch on how you might have observed that their respective differing experiences growing up and how the large range of symptoms they experience, ASD as a spectrum, can correlate, associate with how they interpret the literature differently as well. This is great. So, so all of the questions have been fabulous. Thank you, thank you. Um, so let, let me start with Temple Grandin. One of the things that I discovered with Temple, she had written about it, but I didn't realize it, and I've been on panels with her, um, but I didn't realize it as fully as I should have. She is wildly associative. So in discussions about a short story, you could move, you could be talking about Gentoo penguins and but in 30 seconds had passed and you were, you had moved from penguins to the color black, to wings, to an engineering problem that she had recently solved, to a movie she had seen. And so part of um, the, the reading and discussion process was recognizing for, for myself how much association is part of the writing and the reading of literature. So that was a difference. Um, Dora Raymaker, I, again, I read uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep with her. One of the things she said, and this was fascinating to me, was that she pref much prefers novels that very economically sketch characters give you four things, four descriptions of characters or a setting because her penchant for detail would then be tamed and she could move outward from what scientists call local coherence to global coherence. She wasn't overwhelmed in this process of being invited to imagine 400 details about a setting or about a character. Um, and that was different um, with, uh, you know, compared to the other autistic readers. And then I'd say about Jamie Burke, Jamie has the ability to make movies in his head. Temple can make movies, running movies in her head, but she isn't as talented a spatial visualizer in almost four dimensions as Jamie. So when he read uh, Silco's Ceremony, he opened the spiritual geography of that novel in ways that I never could have apprehended or appreciated. His spatial visualizing abilities were astonishing. As you observed, the neurotypical Ahab is vexed by the whale's unspeaking silence. Did Tito have any response to say the visual allurements of Quiquac in his person, in his tattooed body? Wow, you all are just fantastic with these questions. Absolutely. So one of the things that's so interesting, Tito, and, and this is in another part of the chapter about him that I didn't present today, he very much um, identified with Queequeg uh, uh, as a person of color. And you know, he himself is a person of color. And he also identified with the way in which special ed teachers present, prevented him from using a black ink pen and marker to write all over his desk and his hands. 
And so he saw, um, uh, you know, he felt a kind of solidarity with filling um, the world, the objects of the world with pictures and print. So very, very much so the identification with Tito. One little thing I would add, I'm about to publish with somebody I, I, I work with, uh, Pilar Martinez Benedi, another scholar, an essay that looks at more closely at Ahab's um, uh, phantom limb syndrome and a new condition that neuro neurologists are talking about called mirror touch synesthesia. So I think Ahab has his own um, experiences of a different body that are worth talking about in depth. You talk a little bit more about uh, what your experience shows about the ability of people with autism to have a more advanced education than has been the norm. Yes, this is so important to me. If you think about the fact that by most estimates, my son was only the 10th non-speaking person with autism to get a college degree. Um, you recognize how far behind we are in this inclusion practice. The ADA passed in 1990 is a very late civil rights movement. Um, so one of the first things we need to do, and I mentioned this, is we need to rethink what competence looks like. We, we move, we extrapolate so quickly from a lack of speech or atypical behavior or a refusal to look someone in the eye or a need to touch and smell things. Let me give you an example. Um, prosopognosia, which is otherwise known as face blindness, is disproportionately present in the autistic population. For years, experts read the need to be very close to people in order to smell them as a way of identifying them as evidence of a failure to understand sociality. Typical people use their eyes to keep a distance and to label people. So we have a lot of work to do to discover first and then uh, what that potential is, but then also to feel confident in all of the gatekeeping we do that keep people who are different out of higher ed. And especially, I say this as a professor at Grinnell, these elite schools like Carleton, Grinnell, and Oberlin. There's several TV series portraying autistic persons, including The Good Doctor and Parenthood. What is your opinion about those and what effect do you think they have had for the autistic population as well as the neurotypical population? Another great question. So I'm going to, you know, out myself as this incredibly old person. I don't watch a lot of TV, first of all, but I know, I know the good doctor. I know these, ser these, these series you're talking about. I think it's part of a larger movement of a kind of soft neurodiversity awareness, a sense, think about April as Autism Acceptance Month. I don't want to just accept autism. I want to celebrate it. I want to discover all of the ways in which different people can contribute to what we're doing in society. So I think there are some good things about these shows. My bugaboo is I want autistic people working on the shows, not just as actors, that's very important, but also in the writing. I have a friend in England who helps produce the show Pablo and has a crew of autistic people working on that show. And surprise, surprise, that show is about as progressive as a show could possibly be. This has been quite enlightening, Professor. Would you have a closing comment for us today? Well, yeah, I would just say the questions, first of all, thank you for coming to the uh, convocation and the questions you've asked really give me hope about where we might be in 20 years. When I started this work 25 years ago, I mean, there were so few people um, who were in this field and so few people who responded positively to thinking about autism as difference. So thank you all very much. You give me hope. Well, thank you, Professor Severis, and thank you all for joining us. Our guest next week will be Carl, Carlton uh, Grad and a journalist, Maya Dusenberry, who will examine a medical system rife with inequities in its diagnosis and treatment of men, 
versus women. Until then, be well and be kind. Mm -hmm.